morning. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I see our numbers are back up just a little bit because knowing that last weekend was a holiday weekend and it's just at that time of year where you know you're either going to be one of those congregations that everybody's visiting or one of those congregations that everybody's gone but that's just the way it is but we're glad to see those of you who are come back here this morning we're happy that you're here and also for our guests as well we're happy you've decided to join us and we do consider all our guests our honored guests so this morning if you would open up your bibles to mark chapter 13 mark chapter 13 So before we read uh, these verses here, I want to ask this question. Between right now and when you woke up early this morning, have you had this thought that we ought to be having every day? Is today going to be the last day? And what I mean by that is today the last day. Is Christ going to come back today? Or is today going to be my last day? If I look at the date, whether you look at the date on your phone or whatever, is that date going to be the date that's going to be on our tombstone underneath the date that it shows that we were born? Is that going to be today's date? And so this is something that, you know, the Bible does tell us that we are to be watchful for. We are to be uh, thinking and considering about, you know, is today my last day or is it the world's last day. And if you look in verses uh, 35 of Mark chapter 13, Jesus says here, he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest come and suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And he's not just talking about just literally constantly looking up at the sky, but watching spiritually. You know, again, like I was saying, have we thought yet today, and you may not think in the mornings, you might think in the afternoons, but we ought to be thinking every day, is today the last day or is today my last day? And so this is how we are to be watching spiritually is by thinking, you know, where are we spiritually? Am I still watching for the Lord to come? Uh, In the book of, well, actually, yeah, John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 1. Jesus tells us here, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus is telling here that he is, no doubt, definitely going to come again. He's going to come back for those whom he has built a place for, uh, one of these mansions that are in heaven. And also in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, if you remember, right after uh, Jesus had given us the Great Commission... When he told his disciples, he said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Well, here in the book of Acts in chapter 1, he also lists, uh, there's also several other things here that he says. But in verse 9, it says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in the like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so we know that it is confirmed many times over throughout the scriptures, Christ is going to come again. In fact, Uh, I think it's mentioned about 318 times within the New Testament uh, referring to the second coming of Christ. It may say something about the second coming or the last day or the judgment day or the day of the Lord, however it's referenced, but it's mentioned constantly throughout the New Testament. And that ought to give us the idea here is that, you know, this is something that 
you know, this is the one thing we have got to be watching for. It's about average, average, I'd say, about uh, every 20 verses, there is something referenced in the New Testament about the second coming or about the last day. And so you might even say about 1 20th of the New Testament refers to that last day. And so that tells us, you know, that this here is obviously, no doubt, uh, very important. Now, uh, this is going to be the next and last event that has not yet happened that the scripture says is going to happen. Um, so the most, most important question that we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for this day? Are we ready if this day is our last? Are we, is our soul prepared today? In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll be coming back to this verse several times. So, And you probably if, know this verse by heart. If you don't, you will by the end of this lesson. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. Where it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And Jesus also said, if you remember, at the very last of the New Testament, one of the next to the last verses, in Revelations chapter 22, verse 20, you remember what Jesus said, his last words? He said, I am coming quickly. And so that right there is one of the last things that he said. And so obviously, you usually think that the last words you say are probably some of the most important words. He is coming, and he's coming quickly. Now, quickly, we don't necessarily always mean that he's going to come back here within the next very short amount of time, but sometimes when they say coming back quickly, you know, means I am for sure coming back. And when I do come back, it is going to, you know, it probably will be quick then. So when is Jesus coming back? If we go back to the book of Mark, chapter 13, but this time let's go up to verse 32, Mark chapter 13 and verse 32. Where it says here, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, if you've seen many times, you probably heard on the news or TV or books, whatever, or people even say that, well, this person has guessed that Christ is coming back on this day and at this uh, time. Or they just might even give a day, Christ is going to come back on this day. We all thought that, you know, I'm not saying we all, but many people thought that he was going to come back in the year 2000 at New Year's Eve. Well, we know what happened then. And, it, and you know, these people here, these are what we would call date setters. They are saying that, you know, you know, claiming that they know when Christ is going to come back. Well, what does the scriptures tell us about people like this who think they know something that the scriptures does not talk about? If you turn back to the book of, uh, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 21, where the Bible says here, it says, And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. In other words, don't listen to him then. If what he said had not come true, then you know what kind of prophet he is. He is a false prophet or a false teacher, you might would say. And so, you know, to think that a person would know the date and time when uh, Christ is coming back, when we read in the scriptures here, and it says in other places as well, that no one knows the day nor hour, not the angels, not Christ, you know, that's like basically this person, a person who says they do know, will say, well, Jesus, you don't know when you're coming back, or you can tell even the angels don't know, but I know. Well, what makes that person so special that they know more than Christ or more than the angels, that they know when he is coming back? So there is a reason as to why 
uh, we are not revealed the date and time as to when Christ is going to come back. But if you would turn back to 1 Thessalonians and this time to chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And going to start there in verse 1. And I'm sure when, since he has not told us the day or hour, we probably all automatically know why he has not told us. But we can see right here as the scriptures even plainly points out, it says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And so... Uh, many women who, many of the women here who have been pregnant, you know when the time of labor has come, it's bam, isn't it? It doesn't just quite come on. I think it may be getting closer or close about time for this baby to be born, but it's, it's sudden. It all of a sudden hits them suddenly, just like the flip of a switch. So I've been told. I'm speaking from what I've heard. <laughs> so, but. Anyway, so it is going to be suddenly. And as he says right here, it is going to be as a thief in the night. When is a thief going to come and break into your house? No one knows. And so therefore, that you know, is a good illustration as to why he refers to that time as like a thief coming in the middle of the night. If you turn back to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew, chapter 24. And starting in verse 36, and right here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's actually answering uh, two different questions when he was talking about uh, the end of the temple, the end of the destruction of Jerusalem, but also he is answering the same, another question at this same time about the last day, about his coming. But in Mark or Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 36, it says, "But of that day and hour, no one knows." Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. I'm going to stop right there. So we all know the story of Noah and the ark. We know the reason why the ark was built and what had happened. But he says right here, as in these days they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. In other words, it was business as usual. They were not going to know that day that from any other day. And that's the same as what it is for the second coming. We're not going to know the difference in what the last day is going to be from any other day. As far as we, that's why, you know, as far as we can know, it could be today. When we woke up this morning thinking, you know, well, we've got to... You know, we know here later on we're going to have to get around, get ready and go to worship. And, you know, we've got this later to do this afternoon and that. But we're not going to know that this could be the last day. But that's why it tells us to watch. And so going on here in uh, verse uh, 39, I said, and, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the, the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one taken and the other left. Now people usually use these verses here to refer to the rapture, but he's not referring to the rapture. In fact, if you go back to verse 31, uh, I'm not going to read that just yet, but I'm going to get to it. That is what he's referring to about, one's going to be taken and the other left. But here in verse 43, or uh, yeah, verse 43 says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come back, he would have what? He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. And so, you know, the reason for us not to know is that, well, if we were to know the date and time, well, what are we going to do then? Obviously, we're going to wait up until the last day to get right with God. We're going to wait up until then and say, well, I'm... We're going to get ready for right with God because, you know, today's the last day, but not because, you know, we're thinking of what Christ had done for us and that we are supposed to give our life over to God, but yet we're just going to get ready just because it's the last day. That's why we're, 
you know, that's the reason why someone would get ready if they did know the date and time. Um, kind of like, you know, here uh, a couple, two or three months ago when we had the solar eclipse, you remember that everybody knew about, I will say, what, a year or two ahead of time that the eclipse is going to happen. We knew the section of the country is going to happen in. We knew at the specific time when it was going to occur in each uh, state as it was going to go through. And so people, they were gathered, they were going to go to that spot at that particular time. You know, they didn't get there ahead of time, but they got there at the time when they needed to. Um, really, it was a bad time to be on the road if you were on the road then because you could not get through town uh, under an hour, from what I understood. But they waited until that time to go and see the eclipse. And so if we did not know and if people really, really wanted to see the eclipse, well, what are they going to do? They're going to get there and they're just going to wait until it happens. And so obviously, you know, who's going to want to do that? So, you know, that's why they, thankfully, they did know the time. But just like a thief here, a thief is not going to call and say, hey, I'm going to be at your house July 18th, about 2.45 in the morning to come and rob you. How stupid is that? And so he is not going to let you know ahead of time when he's going to come. And so, you know, why, why would he want to let you know if he is wanting to uh, carry out his mission, which is to come rob you? Well, that's obviously going to foil his own plans if he lets you know when. But the thing is, is that um, God wants us ready now. And the reason why he wants us ready now is for a different reason, not just because it's the last day, not just because, well, today is the day he's coming back, so I want to get ready for that. Well, no, he wants us ready now. And so if we want to be ready for when Christ comes back, we want to be ready for a totally different reason, and that is because he loved us first, gave his life for us, died for our sins so that we may have the forgiveness of sins. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, there Paul said, he said, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And so if we want to really truly be watching for the Lord, if we want to be watching and ready for when he does come back, today is when it needs, we need to start doing it, if we haven't started doing it yet already. Um, in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. It says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin and salvation. And so this is what Christians uh, are to do. We're to eagerly wait for him, uh, for him to appear a second time. So how will the Lord return? Well, we read one ago in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. It said that, you know, well, this same Christ who went up into heaven, he is going to come back from heaven the same way as he went up. And so he's going to come back descending from heaven, but he's not going to come all the way down to the ground. That coming, as it says, he's going to come in the clouds, and that's as far as what the Bible says that Christ is going to come. He's not going to come any further than in the sky, obviously. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, again, like I said, we'll be going back to there again. And this verse here, he gives uh, several, he tells us several things of what's happening on the last day in one verse. But again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, where it said, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now there's going to be, it says, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now, I'm not obviously going to read the rest, because I'm not sure that there's going to be some happen between the trumpet of God and the dead shall rise first, but obviously those two are going to happen. Uh, he is going to come with his mighty angels, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, where it said the Lord is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And... In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, it says there that every eye is going to see it. There's not going to be one eye that is not going to see it. Every eye is going to see him coming. And as he said here in verse uh, 16, he says, For the dead in Christ will rise first. And so also, what about those who are not in Christ? 
When will they be raised? Well, if we go to John chapter 5, verse 28, John chapter 5, verse 28. For Jesus says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And I can't help but say every time when I come to this verse is that, you know, when you hear people say, well, when someone so-and-so died and they're in heaven now or they go straight to heaven, well, folks, this Scriptures does not tell us we go straight to heaven when we die. And you can see that in Luke chapter 16. But here, as he says, for all those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Well, if we go straight to heaven when we die, then who are these people? When we die, you know, we go to, as what Luke chapter 16 says, we go to Abraham's bosom, or as Jesus said to the thief, we go, we'll be with him in paradise. But paradise does not, nece- does not mean heaven itself. In Abraham's bosom, you know, is where the, uh, where the beggar, he was comforted. But when he says, for all those who have died before, all those who are in the graves, they will hear his voice and come forth. And also, in, uh, what, will, what about of us who have not died? What's going to happen at this point? In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, he tells us what's going to happen to those who have not yet died when Christ does come back. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. It says here, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, how we're going to be changed is actually interesting. He says, In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in other words, just as fast as you can blink your eye, that's how, we're, that's how quick we're going to be changing. That's pretty quick to change everybody's body in the entire world into something uh, incorruptible. But in the moment and twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, it says that we shall be changed. For the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and, th- and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And I'm not sure why I read that verse, but it just sounded good to add on to it. But for those of us who are still alive, when we... uh, when Christ does come back, we are going to be changed into an incorruptible body, a body that is suited for eternity, a body that is not going to deteriorate like ours is now, as some of us may feel right now. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31, where there the Bible says that he is going to send his angels out to gather the elect. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 41, I'll just even read that verse. No, I'm sorry. Actually, I meant to write down 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then also in the same chapter, this is where we, I was getting to a while ago, what I was saying in verse 40, where it said, Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and the other left. And this right here is where he says in context, the angels are going out and gathering the elect. Well, the one that is going to be taken is the elect, and obviously the one that is left behind is not the elect. And then we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this time not verse 16, but the next verse, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, and I'm kind of trying to put piece together about maybe what the order of events will happen when it does happen. Um, 
as best I can, but obviously, you know, to get into every detail would take more time. But generally, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, it said, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be with the Lo- always be with the Lord. And so this right here, you know, as many people use uh, this verse to uh, try to prove the rapture theory, but as it says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, well, he said that he's going to send his angels to go out and gather the elect, those who were gathered, the, men, the one man that was gathered in the field and the one woman that was gathered at the mill, they will be gathered up, and so possibly by being caught up, it may be the angels going and getting them, bringing them up. You know, sometimes usually when we think of this, we thought we're just going to rise up off the ground and go into the sky, just kind of like how Christ was uh, risen from this world. Now, I'm not going to say 100% accurately to the detail, but that's what it appears that the scriptures show Uh, that, you know, it is going to be the angels that are going to come and get us and take us up to him. And then also, uh, it is then that we will forever be with the Lord. But the the second coming of Christ is also going to be, the last day is also going to be another day as well. It's going to be a judgment day happening on the same day. Now, the verse where we see where these both here are the same Uh, We find in John chapter 12, verse 48. John chapter 12, verse 48. Where Jesus says here, he says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. And notice this. The word that I have spoken will judge him when in the last day. So the last day is also going to be the judgment day. And as uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, where it said that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things that have, we, have been done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And also, if we go to the book of Revelations chapter 20, John here, he kind of paints a picture of what the judgment uh, scene is going to look like. If you want to see uh, what kind of what the judgment scene is going to look like? He, this is probably one of the best descriptions right here that the scriptures gives us. Uh, Revelations chapter twenty and verse eleven. Where it says, "Then I saw a great white throne, <clears throat> and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the God." And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the works by the things which were written in the books. And so some of us kind of wondered, you know, what are these, all these books? Which books are these? Well, he says here in the next verse that the things that we have done that we're going to judge according to our works, uh, these, he refers here, he said, these things were written in the books. Now, maybe I don't know how if there's a book, if a uh, chapter is going to be one person's life, or maybe your whole life is going to be one of the books that's going to be open. Uh, That I don't know how, but, you know, it's going to be something like that. There's going to be many books, but also there's going to be the book of life open as well. And it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we're going to be judged according to uh, three different things. We're going to be judged according to the deeds that we do. As uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27 says, that... It says, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. And so he's going to render to each one of us according to our deeds. Now also we're going to be judged by not just the deeds that we do, but also by the things that we say. And so we might want to think about how often we might want to keep our mouth shut, because the more things we say, the more things we're going to have to answer for. And sometimes, you know, I kind of... uh, I fall short on that quite often myself. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. 
It says, but I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So we're going to be judged according to our deeds, we're going to be judged according to the words that we say, which obviously are also considered deeds, but also we're going to be judged according to our thoughts. And we think, oh no, <laughs> not the things that I've thought before, I don't want anyone to know what I've thought about, you know. All of us have thought about things that we should not, but we are going to be judged on the things that we think as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, where the Bible says here, it says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from God. But he's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of our hearts. And also you might look at, a, well, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, where he also says there, says, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already, what? Committed adultery in his heart. And so God, you know, it, we see here in the scriptures, he knows what is in man, according to uh, John chapter 2, verse 24 and four, uh, 25. So we're going to be judged according to the things that we do, to the things that we say, even to the things that we think. And that's why, you know, he even tells us that, you know, we are to think of whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, uh, whatever things are pure. You remember the scriptures there where he tells us the list of things that we're to think on. And sometimes when we think of things that we know we're not supposed to be thinking about, and we got to, this is part of watching. This is part of watching for when he comes back, is that watching what am I thinking? Um, you know, we have to be thinking, oh, I need to stop thinking that. I need to get to thinking about what the scriptures say. You know, whatever is lovely, good report, pure, uh, the list of those things, which I didn't even think of, those, write those verses down, but I just thought, thought I came into my head right now, the things that we ought to be thinking about. This day should not be dreaded by any one Christian. Because as Christians, there are perks to have been in Christ, to being a Christian. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says that on the last day, we will have an advocate that will speak for us, and that is Christ Jesus. And also... Uh, the, one of the comforting things is that on the judgment day, you're not only going to have an advocate that is going to speak for you, uh, to represent you, but also uh, saint, the saints, Christians, will have uh, what the Bible says here is perfect sympathy on that day. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17 Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, in all things he had... Uh, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful, and the batteries just died, uh, that he might be a merciful, faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And that word propitiation means to appease, that he is going to appease God for the sins that we have done. And uh, it says, for in that he himself was has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted now also uh turn over to just another page into chapter 4 and verse 15 uh yeah chapter 4 and verse 15 it says for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin let us therefore and this is how a christian should be able to come to the throne of judgment on the second day on the judgment day. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may what? Obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And so what a comfort that is to know that Christians, we have an advocate, we're going to have perfect sympathy, perfect mercy that is going to be there advocated for us. And also, I like what the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8 says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, and he's talking about uh, Lord, uh, Christ Jesus here, who will also confirm you 
to the end that you may be blameless when? In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what a comfort to know is that our advocate, he is going to confirm that we are blameless in the last day. Should we remain faithful unto death, Revelations 2.10. And so we need to ask ourselves, and really this is where we need to be honest with ourselves. And if we're not watching for Christ like we ought to, then we ought to start right here. Being honest, examining ourselves that... uh, where you are right now, even talking about this subject right here of the second coming of the judgment day, how do you feel where you are right now? Is it something that you kind of feel a little scared about or dread about? Well, then that probably might be a red flag that we may ought to re-examine something. Um, you know, if there's something that may be troubling, you know, you know, it may be something that we, the men here at the church, can help you with. Um, but it As a Christian, when we think of the second coming or the judgment day, we ought to be a person who is going to greatly rejoice in that day. And they're going to be the only ones who will rejoice in that day. Um, Because after the judgment day, it's not going to be like our courts here on earth. There's not going to be no appeal afterwards. When the judgment is done, the sentence is passed, it is done for eternity. Um, And so that's the part, beautiful part about being a Christian is that uh, if you are watching like you ought to be, then you have every reason to rejoice when that day does come. Also, in the last day, the other thing that is going to happen is that this earth will be no more. Everything that we see right now is no longer going to exist. Uh, uh, Peter talks about that in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. That once he comes back and he gathers up his saints, that there is not going to be an earth left afterwards. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5, where it says this, For this, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were made of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that existed perished, being flooded uh, with the water, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then you go down to verse 10, where it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. It's not going to be a secretive thing on the last day like they claim in uh, the rapture. But you also are going to have this noise as well at the end of that day. Uh, It says that the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it are going to be burned up. And I'd say nobody is going to not miss that. Uh, That's, you know, hopefully you're not going to be the one of the ones that's left when the angels gather the elect, uh, you know, to have to say, I wish I would have listened to begin with. But so since he says, after he says these verses right here, he says, since all these things will be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and coming of the day of God, because of the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements melt with a fervent heat? And if you notice, that's a long, uh, rec- rec- I forget what, how you say that word. Uh, that's a long question that he's asking right there. Rhetorical question. We know the answer to that. Um, so, like I said, we... When you've read the story about Noah and the ark, you've, you know that story very well. Back in Genesis chapter 6, and I'm not going to cover this for very long, but in Genesis chapter 6, we see right here uh, how it was that the end of the earth at that time was like. It's going to be si- a little bit similar to what is going to be the end of this earth, but of course, obviously with different elements. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 where it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent and the thought of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was, and it grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wouldn't you want to be Noah during that time? Or, you know, a member of his family there. Uh, Down in verse 13, 
It said, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it with inside and outside with pitch. And I'm not going to get into the rest of the details of that. But down in chapter 7, verse 1, it said, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And then down in uh, verse 16, so those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord, what? Shut them in. In other words, he shut the door to the ark right here. And so, like, and I've used this illustration before, if knowing what you know now about the Noah and the flood, say if you went back in time, and you're at that time when you know the end of all flesh is coming, you know that the flood's going to come, what are you going to do? You're going to get in the ark right now, and you're probably not going to step foot out of it until after it's all done. And so we're in that same situation right now where the end is coming, but what do we have to go to for safety? We have a spiritual ark that the Bible teaches us about that we need to be sure that we are in. Just as that there was one ark at that time, there was no other place for salvation but one place, and that was the ark that God had uh, told Noah to build and with specific directions. But today, we have the Lord's kingdom. In other words, his church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, where Jesus said there, he said, And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And he said, And I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose in earth will be loose in heaven. So the church and the kingdom, they're the, both the same thing, being used interchangeably. And I'm speaking through this real quick, so I know time's about gone. But right here, he speaks of the church as a kingdom. And then whenever the kingdom, the church, was finally established in Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, you know that the scripture said there that praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord did what? added to the church daily those who were what? Being saved. The ones who were being saved were being added to the church, which is what we, you could call the New Testament ark today. And so we've seen right here, Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, the church and the kingdom are referred interchangeably. But then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. What's gonna, what is this ark going to do come the end? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24, it says, Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. And so on the last day, the door is going to be closed to this kingdom. He is no longer going to add people to his church or his kingdom. And so we need to be sure that we have gotten through that door before it shuts. And so we're going to offer an opportunity here in just a moment. If you've not yet went through that door, um, you know, if you, want, if you are ready to make that decision today to enter through the door of the New Testament ark or to, as uh, the Bible says, that Christ, he is the door to repent of our sins, to confess him before men and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what will happen when we go through that door is the forgiveness of our sins. But should our end come, our own personal end, as the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, where it says that it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so if we have died before the judgment day comes, before the second coming comes, yet the door was not ever shut, but during that lifetime, the things that we're going to be judged for, the things that we've done in the body, if you haven't went through that door, then it's then too late. The door to your own uh, salvation has then been shut. And so hopefully here this morning uh, you have obeyed the gospel, and I know many of us here who are here have, but if there's anyone here who has not yet obeyed the gospel and is ready to enter into that ark to, be, to start watching for the second coming of Christ, uh, we offer that opportunity here this morning. So whatever your need you have, if you are a Christian, you need the prayers of the church for whatever reason, uh, you can come now as we stand and as we sing.